guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig, it's nine o'clock, it's a talk magic, and I am here today sitting down with a legend of magic. Uh, and I do not use that term lightly, an actual living legend in magic and uh, somebody who has influenced my career greatly. It is the one and only Steve Spill. Steve, how are you doing? Terrific, uh, aloha from Hawaii. It's a, that was such a flattering, uh, uh, introduction. Thank you so much. I, uh, I'm looking forward to talking to you and uh, answering whatever you have to ask. That's fantastic. Well, I know uh, you, you, I, I really appreciate you coming on the channel. I really do. Anybody who's been on this Pleasure. channel for a while, they know how highly I speak of you. So uh, it's it's great that you can come on here. So thank you very much. And and yeah, you are you are living at the moment in in paradise, which is you know I'm looking at the windows behind you. I mean, it looks amazing. It really it's, does. The dark day, you know, it's a little bit rainy. We, I, uh, uh, we live about three miles up the, uh, the mountain from the sea in a rainforest area. So part of the day, it rains every single day. Uh, we're not in a, a tourist sort of spot, but we, uh, so we're not as locked down as other people might be around the world. We uh, are able to walk, I say we, my wife, Bozina and I, we fell in love 25 years ago and uh, have been uh, uh, together since. And uh, so we take daily walks in the jungle and uh, toward the end of the day, we usually uh, head down the mountain to the sea, sometimes uh, take a swim. And in between, I've been uh, uh, writing a new book uh, for magicians and uh, my two previous magician for magicians books, um, uh, Magic is My Weed and How to Make Love to Steve Spillway have just been uh, released in uh, softbound. They were hardcover books before. And um, I, I'm very uh, fortunate uh, that I, my wife and I have seemed to have adjusted okay to um, the, the COVID situation. We've been here in Hawaii for about a year and uh, it's good that the infection rate is uh, the lowest in the country. And, uh, but on the flip side, the, uh, I haven't been vaccinated yet, whereas most of the people I know in, on the mainland, New York City, Los Angeles and so on have been. Uh, but I have to patiently wait my turn as I understand you're doing in the UK, so. Well, there's, you know, there's worse places to wait it out than, you know, in, 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 in Hawaii. It's, I mean, what a great place to, to, to be locked down and, you know. You know, we, we were in the midst uh, of a, uh, a world tour when COVID hit and we were spending a few weeks in Hawaii. And uh, because of this, we were on our way actually to New Zealand and they had just not locked down. And we just decided to stay here and ultimately ended up where we are, uh, at least at the moment. And, uh, but we are anxious to be uh, vaccinated and put COVID behind us and uh, continue our travels and uh, uh, get back to Europe and maybe a couple stops in the UK along the way. You know? Right. Well, let's, let's start at the very beginning. For, for anybody who's been living under a rock and, don't, and, and for anybody who doesn't know who Steve Spill is, Let's start at the very beginning. When did you first get into magic, Steve? Because it feels to me like everybody has always talked about Steve Spill from as long back as I first got into magic 25 years ago. But when, when, did, when did the bug bite with you? Was it... Um... You know, um, I started becoming... Uh, I, I learned my first tricks uh, from my father when I was five years old. Uh, and uh, he... Uh, magic was a hobby. He was in early television. And he met uh, Bill Larson when they were forming the Magic Castle in 63 or 64. By 1965, I was 10 years old and my dad became the manager of the Magic Castle. And all my favorite uncles were um, uh, Di Vernon and Charlie Miller and Slidini and, uh, 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 you know, a and most of these guys were not really working. The Magic Castle hadn't really taken off yet. Uh, they were just building the restaurant at that time, but they had a bar and the close-up theater. And uh, so I started, I became an avid uh, a student of uh, close-up magic and uh, in particular card and card stuff. And Vernon was sort of my mentor, you know, and, and that's kind of started off. By the time I was a teenager, uh, and I was always interested in comedy, uh, but none of those magicians that I just mentioned were really, they were mostly close-up guys and not particularly funny. Um, I enjoyed magic. I also liked comedy. And uh, one year, um, uh, Milt Larson, who created the, built the Magic Castle, ha he had an annual show called It's Magic that played at the Wilshire Bell Theater. 
and he had a guy come out from New York uh, named Al Flasso. And just to give you a little bit of background, at that time, at least to me, what comedy magic meant was tricks that don't work. Carl Ballantyne was considered the famous comedy magician and his tricks didn't work. And so this guy comes out from New York City and I'm there at the, uh, the tech rehearsal and I get to be the, the kid that helps him during the rehearsal with the uh, miser's dream. And then I became sort of fast friends and a giant fan of comedy magic where the tricks actually work. And I became friendly with them and hung out uh, uh, during the week of uh, shows in the dressing room, got to know them a little bit. And uh, uh, by the time I was in high school, like 16, 17 years old, I was uh, working on a stand-up act. Uh, you know, I still did close up, but I hadn't really uh, professionally done much close up. And I started to work on a stand-up act. I called myself Hydini. And uh, I was also friendly at the time with uh, uh, Marvin Roy, Mr. Electric, who had the theme act. And I had made this theme act about recreational drugs. And in the 60s, that was like a big deal. And uh, so I uh, produced bouquets of uh, marijuana. I had the multiplying uh, like hash pipes in between my fingers. And it was ended up with 12 pipes, a few in my mouth, four in each of the fingers. And I would get uh, cotton mouth. My mouth would be really dry. And then cotton balls, like the balls from mouths, would be coming out. And then I uh, to quench my thirst. I would uh, drink a pitcher of beer. And uh, I had a running gag where I snorted tablespoons of white powder. And at the finish, I had like the long pour salt trick. I you know, held my nose in the long pour of salt came out and so on. And uh, so um, to make a long story short, I uh, ended up uh, opening for a lot of bands in local Hollywood nightclubs like the Starwood and the Whiskey A Go Go and the Troubadour and stuff. And I opened for people like a Cheap Trick and the Spencer Davis Group and uh, Little Feet and so on. And uh, I became quite good at uh, working in front of the, uh, at the the stage while they were switching the band equipment for the between the bands. Um, I graduated from that to doing more uh, uh, arena and large concert shows, and I wasn't so good at that. You know, it didn't really translate to the bigger rooms for me. And uh, an opportunity came up. My uh, buddy Bob Sheets, who's uh, he said, "I'm you know I'm opening this bar in Aspen, Colorado. This is about 1976." And uh, so I ended up. He was he was kind of my next uh, mentor, and. Uh, uh, we had a, uh, a bar that fit about 80 people that all of them could see, uh, unlike the kind of close up where you're kind of looking at your hands, it was still sort of a stand up situation. And uh, uh, we would have like the blaring music and everything. And then uh, once an hour for five or 10 minutes, the lights would come up, the music would come down, you would do uh, 10 minutes, and then boom, the lights would go down, the music would crank up and it was time to serve a bunch of drinks. Um, I did that for a, a little over four years with Bob. And because of the stand-up situation, we kind of yearned to do um, uh, a theater show or a stage show, kind of the next graduation from 80 people to. And uh, ultimately, we uh, had a, a dinner theater show in the Washington, uh, D.C. area at the Brook Farm uh, Inn. It was called Magic Comedy Cabaret. And we did a 90-minute show where we each alternated doing stand-up. And we got together, I think, four times in the course of the uh, uh, show to do some illusions together. Uh, the closer was uh, the metamorphosis, the sub trunk, and uh, Bob uh, played Bess Houdini and in complete drag and everything with the, the wig and all this stuff. And I was Harry Houdini, not very uh, muscular or anything, but wearing like the 20s, like full bathing suit from the thing. And uh, we had a lot of great things with that. Uh, that went to uh, 85. And at that point in the United States, uh, comedy clubs were exploding all over the nation. You know, any place that had a brick wall and a light, boom, that was a comedy club. And uh, so I did that several years. These were all one week. Uh, there was a lot of uh, the punchline and the laugh stop. And there were a lot of you know, clubs at that time. I think there were about 500 clubs then. Um, I did that and my kind of home club in Los Angeles was the Comedy Magic Club. And uh, I used to always uh, appear there when I was in Los Angeles. 
I was seen there and uh, uh, got a job in Spellbound, which was the illusionists of its day. It was a uh, uh, not uh, it was a, a touring casino show, and most of those shows were uh, three uh, to six months in one place, which to me was a big relief. Then doing the comedy clubs. Also, the people were coming to see magic as opposed to just strictly comedy, so that fit really good. And I worked with a lot of illusionists have been in that show from the Pendragons to, you know, Mark Kalin and so on. Uh, I was the comedy uh, talk act guy. And from doing the casinos, uh, that led to um, uh, an agency uh, that um, put together uh, opening acts for touring acts. And then I started opening for people for several years, uh, uh, Michael Bolton and Kenny G and so on. And these were all one nighter kind of bus and truck shows. And, uh, and then a guy from that agency broke off and started his own management company, pack packaging similar type of shows uh, for corporate events. And these were also what, not bus and truck shows, but mostly one nighters where, uh, you know, I might open for um, Barry Manlow or something and he's like the star and it's a pharmaceutical company with 2,500 people at the Dolphin Hotel in Orlando or what have you. And um, somewhere in that mix uh, in the 90s, I begin to feel like I, I wanted to have uh, people coming to see magic. I was there just in the mix in all these years. And also I wanted to develop my own show. And the only um, opportunities along those lines would be to do a four wall type of situation. I don't know if they call it that, uh, where you are, where, where you rent a space. And, uh, and so I just figured it would be great to build my own theater. I was living in Santa Monica, which I very much enjoyed at the time. Also an Oceanside air, tourist uh, area of Los Angeles. So I built, um, and at that time that I was considering building this and everything, I fell in love with my wife, uh, actress uh, Bozina Robel, and she at that time was doing parts in sitcoms and parts in movies and so on. And uh, she, she's Polish, she said like a little bit of an Eastern European accent, uh, but she could also play Russians and so on. And she was very often a, a spy or a vampire or something that, you know, fit in that, that mode. And together we built this theater. We, we gutted a building, uh, we built the 150 seat uh, theater and a uh, bar and a uh, like a, a multi-purpose room and then we also had like a souvenir store where we sold uh, programs and posters and uh, layman type magic tricks and so on and we did that show uh, in varying versions from 90 minutes to two hours with a 15 minute intermission for um, and we had also a lot of illusions besides the stand-up and we also did sketches uh, together and so on uh, we did that show 21 years. The opportunity came up to uh, sell Magicopolis and the, uh, we completed that sale in um, September 2019. And uh, uh, it's now known as Illusion Magic Lounge. And it's, we, all, during that 21 period, mostly did the same show. In the beginning, if we took a break, we did book other magicians, but ultimately we just, we took a break. We just were dark for a week or two. Uh, and then he came in with the concept of uh, a different magician every week. He was a, the owner is a former president of the Magic Castle. And he was kind of going with that kind of idea. And then COVID hit. And we're in the midst of our uh, world travels. And we, uh, like I said, been hanging here in Hawaii for a year. That's, that's the long and the short of it. That's, <laughs> I've, I've got that. That was, that was the best synopsis ever. I've got so many questions that the uh, based on everything that you told me and and i'm going to start at the very beginning and the first question is you said that you started off doing close-up and then you moved on to stage and obviously most people steve know you as a stage magician uh that's what you specialized in through the lot of your career do you have any advice for magicians that want to move from close up to the stage? Because you see a lot of close up guys and their ultimate goal is to get on stage, but they're kind of scared of taking that leap. And there's a big difference between performing to two or three people mix and mingle and walking out cold in front of hundreds of people on stage. Is there, is there any advice that you can give as somebody who's spent their entire life performing on stage 
for these performers that want to actually take it to the next level, but they maybe don't know how or they don't know what they should be doing? Well, if there's uh, one big tip I could give, uh, largely if you're a table hopper or, even, or specialize in close up, you, you look at your hands quite often and you uh, develop particularly a, a lot of uh, close up magicians that haven't done any stand up, uh, a kind of hunched over looking down sort of uh, uh, posture. And really, if I could think of one tip, you know, it would be that you want to be able to uh, kind of look at the crowd and communicate rather than one on one or for two or three people to two or three hundred or a thousand people. And uh, uh, I think it's much easier for someone that does stand up to uh, transition into doing some close up than the other way around. I don't know how many, you know, I glossed over a lot of my uh, uh, past, but when I was uh, doing close up, I was also doing kid shows for birthday parties and stuff like that. So I also was getting used to crowd management and having a, you know, not strictly close up sort of thing. And nowadays, uh, and in fact, I also have bits that are sort of close up things that I do on stage. Um, I, I, just off the topic slightly, even though uh, every corporate event or whatever would have like the widescreen projections and everything. So you could do close up like a lot of people do now in a, in a big room. I really prefer, and this is just aesthetic, to if I'm doing a close up thing on stage, like the lemon trick, say, or something, um, to not really depend on the widescreen projection sort of thing. And again, this is aesthetic, but I think the audience tends to start looking back and forth and, do, you know, and I always figured that if I'm doing some close up on uh, stage that um, it has to work without video assistance. That's, you know, just a personal picadillo, not particularly, you know, I don't know if that's a, a hard and fast rule, but it's just an aesthetic thing. You know? Yeah, it's, I totally agree with you. That's brilliant advice. And how would you, how would you, one thing that I've noticed from listening to you and, and also from reading both of your books is you always make the most of every opportunity. I mean, let's make no bones about it. You've had an incredibly successful career. You've performed for the who's who and so many celebrities and top end clients. And, and your book is full of, your books are full of so many different stories. If somebody's just starting out in magic and they want to make a name for themselves, is there any advice that you can give somebody in terms of, you know, go, because you, there's nothing wrong with it, but there's magicians that will just be table hopping in the same restaurant their entire career, whilst you've performed for, you know, you've had a career that most magicians would dream of. What is it that you've done to be able to, to put yourself in that position when so many other magicians weren't able to do that? Well, I'm not certain that I have any idea how the positioning or that, that, that A leads to B leads to Z happens. But I think all of uh, new material and comedy and scripting and making your magic you is and branding and all that stuff is connected and that's sort of it, you know. And uh, I had an inkling for that at the beginning when I was Hydini because it was a time when that was the prevalent, you know, I was in, grew up as a hippie in, you know, in California and that's, you know. So um, uh, it's a little bit of that coupled with the idea that you really make your magic you. And there's really two things I think that all of these things connect with. One, if you're not already doing it uh, and you're listening to this, keep a notebook. Every, artist, uh, musician, you know, whatever, good painter, you know, uh, um, and in there, and I fill them in daily, you know, you put your opinions and memories and observations, and at the same time, you fill your head with uh, art and music and plays and go to museums and, you know, see films and read books, and of course, most of this actually you could do, you know, virtually, but, but in person, it's closer. And you make notes, you know, you, if I see something interesting uh, or I like a bit of dialogue in a film, I jot it down or some lyric or some music or some book that I read that give me a certain feeling or, or music and a, a, or a play that I see that there was some transition that was really great. I make a note of it. And, you know, 
it's keeping that notebook page after page after page every day, just throwing it all against the wall, no order or anything, combined with having a, um, a good knowledge of the, just the basic magic, you know, productions, advantages, transpositions, uh, restorations, tra you know, mentalism, floating, escape, escapes and so on. And you will find, or I've found, I should say, um, although I can give you probably at least a dozen or two tips on how to develop material and make magic you and so you find that the notebook by itself will, if you keep that, if you flip through there, will kind of connect and, and make things for you. You know, I had once uh, jotted down, uh, I really enjoyed Albert Goshman had a, a trick he did in his close up show that I remember from a kid where he it took a coin and slapped it on his head and it stuck there. And then he said, you know how that works? And he took it off and there was a big roofing nail on the back of the coin. It was really fun. <laughs> Some couple of years later, I was uh, sitting at the uh, cappuccino dump uh, drawing in my notebook. By the way, you, I use real pen and paper, pencil and paper, but you could use a digital whatever. And I was, it was around Halloween and I was drawing some crazy mask ideas. And I started flipping through my book and I saw this coin with the nail. And I said, oh, wouldn't it be great if you could take off the mask and there are a bunch of spikes on the back. It'd be kind of the macabre sense of humor. You know, and these kind of things kind of connect almost by itself without all the little tips I might give you to, uh, you know, I once clicked on something uh, and it was um, a blog from a scalper. Do they, I don't know if they call that to where you are, where they buy and tickets and then sell them for a yeah, high yeah, price. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, he, in there, he, he was saying that, um, you know, it's my way to invest in showbiz futures. It's an art of great skill. And, you know, this is like a stock investment. You know, you got to gauge exactly the public demand to the supply. And for those select events that are in demand, you know, I always have the great seats at uh, reasonable prices. And I just was blown away by it. Just funny that, you know, and I wrote down a few sentences about that. And uh, sometime later, I had worked on a, uh, a prediction trick where there's a can of baked beans and at the end they're opened and there's a bag of a clear plastic bag and inside's folded up prediction. And I had in my notebook this thing about the scalper and that became the presentation. You know, uh, wherever you are in the audience, I want you to take out your phone and see what event is playing tonight that you would like to see. You know, there's sporting events, there's uh, all kinds of, you know, and I point to one person and they say, oh, um, you know, I'd like to see on my phone here tonight, there's a Taylor Swift concert in Seattle, Washington. Okay, great. And then somebody else you point to, and who do you want to go with this? Oh, uh, you know, and the guy says, geez, I'd like my dates uh, to be, I'd like two dates to go to this concert. I want to go with uh, uh, Beyonce and Nicki Minaj, you know, and then some other person takes the change out of it. It's 42 cents. And lo and behold, you you know, you have somebody uh, come up and they open the can of baked beans and they reach in and open the thing and they un undo the prediction. And it's that that's sort of how things develop by themselves from your notebook. Um, a lot of other things that are important to put in your notebook are memories. You know, I, I have an, in, in, at least once in every show, I like to have some nostalgic memory thing from my childhood. I like to have some observation or opinion and and so forth. I have a little checklist of things that I like to include. And uh, I think in there, uh, memories are really good. I think the more that you can connect to people, the better. And uh, having at least one childhood memory in every show for me has been a thing that works. Um, you know, when I was a young boy, I used to wear the same shoes uh, every day. And you know, the heel would get to, worn down to the nails and the, the sole would be flapping in the wind and the laces would be knotted and broken and so on. And uh, the shoemaker was my hero. I would go to the shoemaker and he would, you know, nail on the new heels or cut out a leather of the new sole or unknot and relace up the new. So I worked out a trick that uh, is not unlike Clippo, but with a shoelace. And so every time my shoes would be ruined, I'd clip the shoelace and then it's restored by the shoemaker and, and so on. 
Uh, I have several tricks that have fallen. In one of my books, I have the Eddy trick, which is a, a presentation of the uh, invisible deck. I don't know if you're familiar with that or not, but uh, you can, yeah. Anyway, so I, I think that having some the one memory thing is also a way of connecting with audiences. And if you can make the memory or the opinion or whatever work so that the magic is not ruined, but embellished, this is sort of like the balance. Like I always like, even though I enjoy comedy and so on, usually the last beat is the trick. I might have a tagline that's a joke or funny, but I wanna make sure that the magic for me, at least, you know, there's a lot of comedy magicians that are more interested in the comedy and I really like both. And I wanna make sure that the magic doesn't get swallowed up um, uh, by the presentation. Um, I think that uh, uh, observations are, are, or opinions uh, are good. Um, you don't have to go overboard with political or religious stuff. I a little bit dabble into that. I have one trick in one of my books, Red and Blue. Um, when I, uh, uh, it was a, uh, a knockoff of the Spellbound show. There was another one called Kazam and it was uh, uh, Brett Daniels first, uh, like big illusionist show. And I was the talk comedy MC because it was a casino show. And the producers had produced a lot of comedy stuff with blackouts. The guy's name was actually Breck Wall, the producer. And so, you know, right before the, his big finish at that time, I think it was the uh, water torture cell, you know, uh, he wanted to blackout and something funny that led into like the danger thing, but a little bit, you know. And uh, uh, unlike uh, the UK or other parts of the world, you know, guns are really prevalent in the United States. And, you know, I had sort of an opinion on that. Uh, and I, I could see how someone could fall in love with the gun, but at the same time, you know, it's deadly and people shouldn't be walking around with machine guns and stuff like that. So um, I had a, uh, a routine that um, I used to watch a lot of World War II movies and I fell in love with the German Luger. And I was at the gun show with a friend of mine in New York and I got a German Luger and I, I was, you know, playing with it, I was posing with it in the mirror. It was like a sexy handgun. It had the comfortable grip and extension and ejection. And kind of, you know, it was almost like a phallic kind of thing, you know? And so as I'm talking about this and my hands are empty, I, a gun appears in my hand. And when I pull the trigger, it's a bang gun and a little flag comes out that says bang. And when I pull the bang flag away, I have what appears to be a real gun in my hand. And I fired and there's a loud report, bang, you know, and then a dancer stumbled out from the wings and fell dead, you know, on the stage. And then there was a blackout. So it was a way of giving an observation and an opinion, uh, but still having some, the magic. The restoration is always really great for that sort of thing too. Uh, like I mentioned with the shoelace or, I mean, there's, there's a lot of really great things that, uh, uh, Anyway, that's that's kind of the, the general idea. And then I have a lot of tricks along the way if I have something really specific that I want to work out. Uh, one of them is um, is adapting. You know, when I mentioned the uh, snorting the tablespoons of white powder, this was, um, I, I used uh, a spoon with a lump of um, uh, plaster of Paris on it, like they use for the cake in the hat to put flour in the cake in the hat. And, you know, by adapting that to sort of a paddle move and a, you know, I could snort tablespoons away. So adapting is one thing that I'm uh, really big on. I'm also really big on combining methods. Uh, I years ago had a, um, a, uh, a trick to combine the prayer vase and the rising pencil that has the thread on it out of the bottle. And you, uh, you can find it somewhere. It was a like I pretend I had a little dog and I put it in the bottle and, you know, it, I put the big pencil in and a tug of war and thing and it jumped out and so on. And uh, uh, that's just a quick example, but combining methods is very good. I also think modifying uh, methods is really good. You know, uh, for instance, the, uh, I mentioned the long pour salt trick. Well, uh, and I also mentioned the, um, the dye tube with the, changing the color of the handkerchief, the red and blue trick. Um, as it happened, the, uh, uh, the gimmick for the long pour salt trick was 
really modified and better for using the color changing handkerchief because you could use bigger handkerchiefs and, and they would be wrinkle free. So, you know, the modifying is another, uh, substituting is also something that I do quite often. Um, I have a, uh, I usually have maybe one card trick per show. It might be the cards across or something, but only one, you know, or the invisible deck or something, you know. Um, I adapted the, uh, uh, a six card repeat trick with leaves that I used instead of cards. It's called Leave Me Alone. It's in one of the, I forget which one, I think the love book. And, you know, I had a thing about when I was a kid hitchhiking to some outdoor theater in the woods to do some show and I, left my car, a deck of cards in the car that picked me up hitchhiking and I improvised the trick with a bunch of leaves. And you know. so I think that uh, substituting is really good. Um, I also do a lot of like switcheroo type stuff. Early on in my uh, uh, career, I had done a, um, a coloring book, you know, the regular magic coloring book, but with the Playboy magazine. And uh, I was at the barber shop reading the Playboy magazine, and you had to wear these special glasses to look at the Playboy magazine. And so I'm flipping through there, and the you know it all has naked pictures of women, and and but you know if you take off the glasses, it and, and flip the cover over, it looks like a Superman comic book, and you flip through, and it's all comic books, but with the glasses on, and you know. So um, I'm in there looking at the Playboy and the, the barber says, Steve, your mom's coming in. You know, I'm in a teenager looking at Playboy and boom, I changed the, the thing and now it's the Superman comic book, but the centerfold falls out. And you know, have you seen this? He wants a centerfold, she's a real pig. And you turn around and it's a big uh, a poster of Miss Piggy. This was a, kind of the coloring book, but it was just like a little bit of a switcheroo uh, to a, a, another idea. And um, those are some of the techniques that I've used to develop new material and, and uh, do make comedy magic and, and make the magic you. If you really keep that notebook, everything in the notebook is sort of filtered through, it sort of has your taste in there. And that's what's making everything you is keeping track. You can never have too little uh, information or uh, you never have too much information. You definitely can have too little, you know. If you're constipated for a week, make a note of it, stick it in there. You know, it might, it might come in handy for something that you're using, you know. Um, I also think that uh, uh, testing uh, your material is super important. You know, it's funny, uh, yesterday, uh, and periodically people post this uh, David Bowie quote of not playing to the gallery. And I understand that, and it's a, a really pure thing, but, I really think as a, a performing audience, artist, particularly a magician, that um, it is a collaboration with the audience. And, and you know, even though it's more you than the audience, I think that, that one of the compromises that you make as a performer is um, having the audience help decide what's really gonna be good for your show. And so I'm a big proponent of uh, uh, testing and uh, customizing and reworking your material in front of an audience to, uh, and you know, I think of a lot of new stuff, but very few things end up staying in forever. Only the ones that have been really crafted, you know, based on audience response. And uh, I think that's, that's really key, you know? Well, I mean, that is incredible advice, like literally priceless advice for anyone that's trying to develop their own tricks and, 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 and find their own way. But let me ask you one question about your character, because one thing that I've noticed about watching you perform is you can tell uh, your, your performance style is very, very unique. And you can tell, like, even if you're doing the same trick as somebody else, like the Invisible Deck, it's, it's done specifically for you. It's done in a way that nobody else would do it. And I think that comes down to characterization. And, and a lot of magicians, when they, they put their act together, they'll get this trick and that trick and the other trick, and it might not necessarily fit their character. So no matter how many notes they make, no matter how much m material they create, it might not be suitable for them. How can a magician find a character? How did you find your character? Is there any advice you can give with that? Because you have got such a unique character on stage. 
Well, you know, it's evolved over the years. And when I was a, a young man, I tried to craft that character like Hydini, right? I once had worked out a, a 20 minute show as Cloroxo, some bleach superhero, you know. And these were really shallow one dimensional figures. And uh, again, going back to the notebook, what, who you, I think, and this is, there are exceptions to the rule. I mean, there are guys like um, Tom Sony or uh, uh, Mr. Electric or something that uh, uh, spend their whole life chiseling away at that one. Uh, Norm Nielsen was another one, you know, or Mr. Electric. They exactly are working on this whole thing their whole life, which is fine. It was great. And it's sort of the made up character, you know. I think the closer that you can in, in incorporate some of the elements of who you really are is important. You know, in the, um, in the US in the 50s, Melbourne Christopher, you know who that is, right? Melbourne yeah. Christopher, yeah. He was the, in the 50s, the main magic guy. He did TV specials. He was a guest on hundreds of shows. This is early television. Not everyone even had a TV, uh, but you, it was impossible to see who that person was. You just had no idea. And Mark Wilson in the 60s, successful with the, a couple different TV series and did specials and so on. And also, you know, it was exactly vanilla. You couldn't tell anything about his memory or his observations or opinions or what sort of a guy he was. It was kind of a blank slate. You know, I don't think that really works anymore. Uh, if you, I mean, you know that Darren Brown uh, you know, I was into coffee and collects taxidermy and he was gay and so on. Or you know that uh, Penn and Teller are uh, uh, atheists and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I think today the coin of the realm is that it doesn't mean that you should just have Tourette's and blurt out every single thing you think, but really a reflection of who you are is really what's, what's necessary. So it isn't, so if you find uh, that you want to make a, uh, are you working on a restoration trick and you only want to have one in your show. You don't want to put the cut and restored rope and the torn and restored newspaper next to each other. It's sort of the same thing. And you think, oh, I'm kind of a romantic guy. And you might come to uh, uh, taking a flower and that old game of whether or not the, your affections are being returned. She loves me, she loves me not, she loves me. And you, you know, tear off those petals and it comes to the end and she loves me not and oh, you've got to restore it and try again. So that you know, you can make sure that your affections are returned or maybe you are a, uh, uh, an, an evil sort of uh, Dracula, the character or you've, um, you're really ambitious and you've made, I once saw in a movie and it's in a lot of movies that someone makes a pact with the devil to sell their soul for success. And you know, your your pact with the devil is written in blood on a cocktail napkin, and you realize that's not what you really want. So I want to get out of this uh, deal with the devil, and you to tear it up, but it keeps restoring. You can't get out of the deal with the devil, and this made me reflect the Alice Cooper, uh, Marilyn Manson sort of guy that's doing a restoration trick. And I think that the uh, the more multi sides of yourself that you can show with the memories and observations and opinions and, and uh, uh, getting influence from the kind of the art and music that you like and the plays or music. Go, going to museums is great. I, I was, uh, you know, uh, my wife and I are big Van Gogh fans. I was thinking of doing a one coin like slight any routine with a cut off ear, you know, at one point. Um, you know, art galleries, books, films, uh, just fill your head uh, and, and besides your opinions and memories and everything, um, it isn't bad to be influenced by things that you like. And when you keep a notebook, those things are all filtered through you. So those are your own opinions and aesthetics. And I like to let that be the guide in comedy and magic and, and performing and communicating. And I think that's and that's the secret, really, I think. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Now, through your career, you've, you've, you've created so much magic. And obviously, a lot of it you've put in your two books, which we'll get to in a bit. But I have a question for you. Um, 
over the years, you've released magic through Bob Kohler and various other places. Um, some iconic Steve Spill routines. My question is, why did you do that? I'm glad you did, by the way, because as you know, the mind reading goose is a feature of every show that I do. But why did you do that? Because you're so, it's not like you were a struggling magician who needed the money. So it's like, oh, I'm going to sell some magic tricks. You, you were doing remarkably well, really successful. And then you take something that's iconically yours and release it for sale to the magic community. Was there a reason behind doing that? Sure. You know, first of all, I've done it very sparingly in my entire career. I've put out maybe three or four tricks and I only put them out after I was done with them. In other words, uh, I, my career is evolving and uh, the guy that um, uh, did the uh, mind reading goose or the blood from stone or the needles is, um, it is me, but it's, and I could still do that material, but it isn't who I am today. That was a different guy. Okay. That was a completely different guy. And I'm constantly evolving. And my most current material, nobody sees it because it isn't ready to be released to the magic community. And when I've, those few times that I have put out things are, um, I'm no longer doing them. And uh, in the case of the goose, I was, uh, Bob Kohler knew I wasn't doing it. He asked me about releasing it. Um, he said, Scott can make the stuff with his grandma and, and uh, sound like a great idea to me. And I wasn't, and that's the last thing I put out. And I think that was in 2003. Mm. So, you know, it's not like I'm releasing stuff every, no, I take that back. I have one other thing that I limited release um, and is no longer available, which is my tattoo book. I don't know if you're familiar with that or not, but since it's not available, I mean, I can tell you about the routine, but it's not, yeah. It, it, go for it, yeah. Um, I, uh, I should really back up. Originally, I had a, uh, an idea 25 years ago that a book test is better with a picture than a word because you can really elaborate and get a lot out of it instead of, oh, you're thinking of the word so-and-so, you get the, and I had at that time uh, assembled a book, which I had to make by hand and get pages from all different books and everything, which was apparently a, uh, a coffee table picture book from Rolling Stone that had pictures of all different celebrities, rock celebrities in there. And uh, uh, this is when I was opening for, um, uh, when I lost the book, I remember, I was opening for Kenny Loggins at the Shell, also in Hawaii. And uh, I would have somebody come up and open the book anywhere and they would see the picture and then close the book and concentrate. And I'd say, oh, you're thinking of, uh, oh, would I get the impression, uh, the spotlight's on, there's a big crowd. Uh, this artist has, uh, he's kind of skinny. He looks, he has big lips. He's, it's Mick Jagger. And then they, you know, and you know, you could really elaborate on that. Uh, today, of course, nobody, rock stars mean nothing. There is no, you know. So I had lost this book and for many years, I had uh, just didn't do that trick. And then it occurred to me one day, this would be a great idea to do with tattoos because the tattoo parlors, they always have a big book of all the different tattoos that you could choose from. So I, I worked out a routine where, uh, and I had to make the book myself, draw the pictures, have it printed, so on, just to do this one trick. And uh, since I put a lot of effort into it, I also made a hundred books, tattoo books, which I sold, you know, and uh, it's, it's exactly that, you know, uh, I have some woman come up from the audience. I ask her if she has any hidden, you know, butterflies or any tattoos or so on. And there's a lot of comedy shtick and she opens the book anywhere and thinks of a tattoo and, and then you get, and it's not a force. It's really a real free choice out of a hundred different tattoos. Um, I don't know how we got onto that topic, really, but you know. <laughs> no, you know, I think probably the uh, well. If you have any other questions, let's let's go for them. Sometimes the uh, my digressions get off the yeah, I, chart. I, I, I have no problem with you digressing. Yeah. Yeah, I have no problem with you digressing. Yeah, it was. Um, it, it, I was. I was just wondering because obviously you know you bought these this material out and you're right and one thing that i have noticed and i think this is a really good thing is when you bring something else as a standalone piece 
it's normally a very high priced item. Um, which well, is, this is pretty really exclusivity. Yeah. yeah, which is which is very important. Um, when I realized I was doing an interview with you, Steve, I asked um, my subscribers if they had any questions. And one question that came up again and again and again is, uh, does Steve have any, have any advice on how to be funny, how to be an actual, uh, more on the comedy side? Because, you know, you, you are a comedy magician and you did say earlier on that although you're a comedy magician, the magic is very important to you. But one thing that's really kind of, you can see through all of your performances is not only are they very magical, they're very entertaining and very funny. Have you got any advice on how to inject humor into a, into a performance? Yeah, I think, well, first of all, I think that some people are funny without any sort of, Bob Sheets is one. You could give him a blank, you have him read the phone book, it's gonna come out funny. And there's some people like David Williamson or Michael Finney or whatever, they're just funny, you know, I unfortunately am not funny like that. You know, I actually have to write scripts and work on my stuff and and kind of craft it. And you know, off uh, today with you, I'm a little bit in between. But normally, on the uh, the scale of being on, I'm usually not on. I'm a two or a three or something. And on stage, I might be seven. And most of the time in my early career, I was very kind of low energy. As I've gotten older, I've become more high energy and more uh, character-ish uh, than I was earlier. And so the evolving sort of thing, like the material that I've released, it's, yeah, I could do that, but it's it's no longer me. I've met people and they say, you're, you know, you're more like you now than, than all I've seen on the DVD. And, you know, I don't know what that means, but it's sort of like, you know, I'm not that guy anymore, basically, is kind of what, what it is. Um, there are a lot of techniques that you can use uh, to be, I, one of the things that I um, uh, put in one of my books, I made up an acronym, PESK, P-E-S-K, that, and these aren't my rules, this is my way of kind of remembering them, whether I'm ad-libbing or writing a script, and, and, and P is like, you put the punch at the end. You know, if you're going to do, a lot of times if you do the card on the forehead, and it takes a long time for the guy to notice that you have the card on your forehead while he's looking for the card through the deck or whatever, you know, um, it's easy to say, uh, "Oh, I'm, get, uh, you know, I'm getting real tired of this uh, trick and so on." And the tired really should be at the finish. To make it a tiny bit funnier, it should be this trick makes me real tired. So that when you hear the tired, the punch is sort of at the end. So the P is sort of for punch. Whether you're ad living or writing a script, that helps. The E is um, to uh, exaggerate. So you're with, with the card on the forehead guy and he sees the card on the forehead and, you know, don't feel bad. The last guy that did this, he was a hundred years old and so on. Well, you know what? A thousand year old is funnier because nobody's a thousand years old. So, you know, he's there and he's, and you know, it took the last guy, you took longer than the last guy to know something important. And he was a thousand years old, better than a hundred years old. So the exaggeration is kind of the, um, the other thing is uh, to be really as specific as you can, you know, uh, uh, the finish alone, like the missionary position alone, doesn't cut it. You need a midget and a monkey and a bottle of head and shoulders to get any kind of boner. You really want to have some specificity. Specificity. Sorry, I'm not. Uh, uh, take a drink. Getting my uh, uh, words. Uh, and then uh, K is an old one. Just the K sound is really. Uh, Good is if you have a choice of words, you um, you know that thousand year old guy from Kazakhstan on the Caspian Sea is uh, funnier than Stuart from Sepulveda. It just there's some reason I don't know if it's really true or not, but I always kind of that K sound kind of thing sort of helps. Um, the other thing is this uh, for magicians, you have a big advantage over a lot of other type of performers you can start to develop a Rolodex in your brain because these a lot of things, situations come up over and over again. On the very low end, you're always going to have audience volunteers. You should have a big Rolodex in your brain about funny things to say with people's names, where they're from, what their job is, so that um, 
if the, you, know, you ask a guy who's helping you, what's your name? He says, Rich. And you say, oh, not by the looks of the outfit, you know, or, you know, your last, you get the idea. You know? um, you know, they say their name is Joe. You know, is your last name Mama? Joe Mama, you know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, they, they say they're retired and you say, uh, geez, you look so young. Are you sure you're not just lazy? You know, any kind of, you know, so you get a good, and I have in, and um, I think my, uh, I love book, a big list of a lot of name jokes that you could kind of use to come up periodically. And uh, uh, same with their occupations, uh, uh, where they're from. Oh, you're from Paris. So you're a parasite, you know, the, those are things that you should have a, or that help because a lot of the, if you want the big punch to be the magic at the end, a large part of the comedy is in the premise and the procedural things that you do to uh, accomplish the trick more in the beginning and the middle as opposed to the end. And as I say, you could still have a tag uh, line at the end. Um, the other kind of improvising is uh, where it's completely unplanned. And this kind of, I, I've uh, over the years developed a few exercises for this sort of thing. You know, normally if you look up improv in a, uh, uh, generally speaking, improvisation is considered when two actors playing characters in an imaginary situation are interacting with each other. And the magician kind of variant to that is that you're playing yourself, it's in the here and now, and there's no fourth wall, the audience is part of the thing and any, anything could happen. Uh, I'll give you some examples or one or two that I could think of the, at the, off the top of my head of things that just happen and you, you know, uh, have an ad lib. And then I'm gonna mention a few quick exercises uh, that you might do to, to work on improvising uh, as a magician, as opposed to an actor. Um, I used to do the, uh, for my closer in my Magicopolis show, the table of tear. There's 39 sharpened steel spikes. I'm, you know, chained to the table, and the, you know, the, you know the trick. The ropes on fire. There's seconds to escape. And in the course of setting up the trick, I would have a volunteer come up, and to make sure that these are uh, not rubber or collapsible, I want you to check the spikes and all the device. And uh, some big burly guy comes up, and he touches the spikes, and he goes, "They're rubber." And you know, of course, the whole audience cracks up, and it's really funny, and so on. Um, and further in the routine, I would say, you know, our, uh, our lucky volunteer will be secured to the bed of this device as part of my normal pattern. Everyone cracks up and the spectator, the volunteer is going no way and so on, you know. So I get to that point and he's going no way and they're cracking up and I say, don't worry, they're rubber. And, you know, of course, the, I think the audience is like two minutes there, they're laughing and everything. And when the people are laughing, this is when you try and think of the next line. When people are quiet, you're sort of talking and when they're laughing for a long time like that, you go through the list of things in your mind, what would be, in a, you know, so it died down and I said, you'll be okay, there's an airbag and, you know, get another kind of a laugh. And uh, one of the ways to practice these uh, improvising things is to pretend that you're a, uh, a TV announcer or radio commentator and just when you're driving or walking around, make a commentary running out loud of everything that you see. Oh, it's a sunny day today. There's an old woman walking her dog, you know, and then try and make some ad libs to make it really sort of humorous. So, that, and you do this all the time, every day, you'll start getting that improvising sort of uh, mind, you know, that, oh, there's a, it's a sunny day. There's a, an old woman here walking her German shepherd. It's not a dog. It's a young, handsome man from Stuttgart, you know. And then you kind of, another way to do that is, you know, you flip through the book or the dictionary and you pick out a word and whatever word that is, you start associating, well, you know, uh, you uh, open the books, just flip through there and stick your finger and it's the word white. And then you start thinking, what is that, you know, a ghost, a snowman, a, you start, these are ways of practicing the kind of improvising that we, we do as uh, magicians that comment on things that are just unfurling in front of us right at the moment. Good way to do that too is look through a, a book of posters or artwork or something or photos, you know, in a magazine. And, uh, uh, you know, you see the picture of the baby with a bunch of spinach and all over her face and everything. And you might think, oh, you know, I'm not gonna let the babysitter feed him anymore. But, you know, if you think about it a little more, it might be funnier to be a slight few steps later. 
oh, you, you shouldn't use the spinach shaving cream on the, with the baby or something. So that you, and when people are laughing in particular, like I mentioned in the uh, that spikes anecdote, um, that's when you kind of go through when I was younger, I might just blurt out the first thing that comes to mind. But when they're laughing, you have an opportunity to uh, maybe the third or fourth thing that I think of is going to be funnier and then have an opportunity to stay, say that. Very often it works like this. Um, one thing you know, you're thinking of and it reminds you of something else in your mind. What does that remind me of? What does that remind me of? I don't know if you, uh, I assume that you know the game Scrabble. It's the same kind of thing like that. You know, you, you get a bunch of letters and you see a plug and then you, the, your brain rearranges and it's the word help. And then you put down help. You know, that's the same sort of uh, brain mechanism for uh, improvising or, or ad-libbing with, without preparation. And those, there's some other exercises in my books. Those are the kind of things that sharpen your uh, ability at that. So it's a combination of, uh, you know, the, the planned kind of Rolodex ad-libs uh, the really unprepared ad libs and scripting. And the best part is, is that uh, when you improvise, you don't really have to 100% hit. You know, if a third of the time it's your improvs or your ad libs are really funny, that's good. And if you, something goes sour, you have your script so that you can go back to that. To uh, And uh, that's a kind of safety net that normal people, that actors that improvise don't have that. They don't have that outline to go back to. They're just, you know, so. Anyway, I hope those, that answers some of the, you know, I could give you a lot of other little things. I don't know if they're helpful or not. Um, oh, yeah. I think uh, uh, callbacks and tags are really important too when you're uh, doing a, a show. Um, if you're not familiar, the callback is a really easy one or two word thing that you can refer back to something that happened in the past and it gets a laugh really easily. You know, I was once, I used to, this is years ago, I did some, a lot of corporate events for the Herbalife company. It's like a multi-level marketing kind of company. And, you know, I came on after the speaker and one of us, the last things he said is in conclusion, don't cold call on Mondays. I mean, I, cold call, I assume means the same in the UK. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I came on, the first thing I said, so I was uh, uh, cold calling on Monday and then, you know, boom, this is it's already left. And uh, so that's kind of the example with it. And uh, a tag is like an extra word or two that you could put on top of that that makes it funnier and funnier and, and, and so on. Um, I have uh, in my uh, uh, weed book a, a, uh, a manufactured sort of callback and tag system called OA. I'm not going to go into the big details of it. You read the book. It's kind of, uh, this is a giant crutch for me. You know, I use that OA system every show still do, it works perfect. And it doesn't matter if there's 25 people in the audience or 2,500 people in the audience, it works great. And you know, uh, I stumbled upon this thing and it's a uh, like a pre-planned system that I orchestrate into every show that has uh, a bunch of, uh, you know, has a, a really good strong callback with audience participation and a good uh, various tags, you know, on the end of that. And I think those kind of things, uh, uh, whether I have different ones also that are uh, even more specialized for audiences that are family audience or kid audience or teenage audience, or I have also little running things like that, but you know. That is, that is amazing advice. It really is probably the best answer I've ever heard to that question ever. Um, I had one other question that people asked me to ask you that came up over and over again, which was, in your very long career, has that? Can you tell us one story that's happened? What's the funniest thing that's ever happened to you um, when you were performing? <laughs> I know you've got lots of stories. I've written both. I've read both books. I know there's lots of stories, but uh, I don't. Well, let me think of one that I haven't written about for a second here. You know, I uh, I mentioned to you I did the. Uh, corporate events when this manager broke off from the agency and started packaging those kind of shows. I, uh, I once I, was an opening act in, uh, in San Jose, uh, California. I wish it was actually San Jose in Costa Rica, but it was half as that. And I opened for um, uh, Barry Manlow, and, which, and before they said, don't talk to Barry, he's, he's not friendly, just 
you know, avoid him, but, you know, and, you know, already I'm thinking I would rather be working with someone else than, you know, I get to the hotel and unbelievable in my room, this is a very expensive bottle of champagne. It says, have a great show, Barry. And I'm like, oh, he's not that bad of a guy at all. You know, it's really great. And, you know, so, well, it turns out at the end, you know, and of course on a corporate event, they pay for your room and everything but I get this $300 bill for a bottle of champagne. And, you know, I didn't, you know, I, the room service thing has my name on it, but I didn't sign it. And, you know, he, he's, you know, I had to, I didn't have end up having to pay for it, but it's just kind of funny that, you know. I can't believe that. It's <laughs> unbelievable, that's crazy. Oh my gosh, okay. Um, here's a question, you've got two books. I wanna talk about the third book in a minute but you've got two books for somebody who's uh, watching this interview that's not really read either of your books, but is now inspired to do so. And they're trying to pick which one to, to buy first. W w is there one that you'd advise over the other in terms of content? Um, uh, no, not really. The, the, I, I know think that's going to come up in the comments, you see, so I'm going to ask it now. Oh, I, I don't know if they were, I, I you know, they, I've just, uh, after a couple of years, reissued them in uh, softbound. This is the one that uh, magic is my weed. And uh, they're both about the same length. This one is uh, uh, how to make love to Steve Spillway. Uh, they both have uh, uh, 12 routines uh, complete with the scripts and ex exactly how to do them, which is a launch pad for you. You can customize them however you like or try them as they are and uh, you know. Um, and then the first part of each book um, has uh, different theories and uh, things that I've uh, come across or feel that works to uh, help you as a better performer. Um, if you're uh, not familiar with me and you don't want to take the plunge into these books, you can on Amazon uh, get I Lie for Money, which is my memoir, which was uh, published for the public and you can get a Kindle version or a uh, Audible or something. And then you'll have an idea about that. Part of the, uh, uh, the popular reading length for a uh, for the public memoir is about 60,000 words. And I uh, uh, it turned in 89,000 words having not written a book for the public before. And a lot of the autobiographical uh, anecdotal stuff that was edited out of the book, it does appear uh, to uh, uh, make examples of some of the various uh, performances or things I've done. And the uh, How to Make Love book has a bit more autobiographical stuff, the same amount of routines as uh, Magic is My Weed, but a little more autobiography. That's about it. And, and just so I can put them down below, I know they're available for all good dealers, but do you have a- No, no. There's oh. an, they've been sold out for over a year from all dealers. The only way to get these new ones that I've uh, re the hardback books that are now issued in softbound is to stevespill.com. And uh, I've uh, printed up a few hundred of each book. And after that, that's it. And I'm working on a new book uh, well, as I'm fun. here. And, and uh, I expect to be publishing uh, one new book by the end of the year. And, and is that going to be more of the same, more routines and also autobiography? Uh, Exactly. It's okay. uh, I'm tentatively calling the book Assassin. It's you know, and it's specifically about um, how to develop new material, how to assemble uh, different routines into a show, and how to make a living doing that. And that's what the focus of my uh, the book I'm working on now is. And I expect to uh, have it complete and published before the end of the year. And that will be available again through Steve Spill. Yes, as a matter of fact, it will be. Awesome. Awesome. Now, obviously, a lot of people know you from running uh, Magicopolis for 21 years. A couple of questions about that. First of all, was it difficult? You know, you spent your entire life on the road, literally globe trotting, going from one high end event to another. Um, was it difficult to then say, well, actually, I'm just going to be in this one place and and not travel as much and just just it just... was a pleasure i started working on uh i'm 66 now i started developing the magic apples when i was 40 years old um and uh, uh everyone told me 
this is crazy. Don't do it. You're going to lose money. It's not going to work, you know. And uh, I think the same as a, a Broadway show or a long running uh, Vegas show, um, not only got better and better and better. And uh, as far as the performance uh, and so on, you become known. And, and part of the uh, secret of, um, uh, you know, 10, there are 10 million people that live in Los Angeles County. I could never run out of audiences, you know. And, uh, and re the, really the big secret is that um, for people that, that become aficionados of the show and bring other people to come see it. And, you know, it's kind of like going to the opera, or the uh, audience, uh, some concert or something for these people. They're, they come and they already know all that's kind of what you do and everything. They want to see the reaction on the other people. They want to see the, the, the new interpretation, the ad libs, the things that only happen in that one show. And they bring other people or they bring people for their uh, birthday or their out of town guests uh, come to the show. And one of the secrets of uh, in Los Angeles, you know, we were compete, you're competing with everything from uh, Disneyland to the Hollywood Bowl to on any given day, there are many options for the entertainment dollar. And one of the things that uh, helped us, that sort of, a, I don't know if this is true in the UK or not, but sort of a cult thing, um, every laundry cleaners, every liquor store, uh, whatever, that's been around a long time, they have pictures of celebrities on their walls that have, that's where they go to, uh, get that deli, that's where they go to get their cream cheese and bagels, or that's where they get their dry cleaning done. And uh, that sort of thing exactly worked for us. Um, we were very fortunate at the beginning that uh, uh, Penn and Teller threw me a bone and uh, did the show when I first opened. And there was a number of celebrities that came to that performance. And we have uh, kind of done the same thing at the, over the years, like the laundromat or the cleaners or the, uh, the deli or the liquor store, this is where we buy our alcohol and there's a, a picture of uh, John Malkovich or something, you know. We did the same thing and it works really great because people get the impression that if, you know, um, Danny DeVito or uh, Elton John uh, goes to this magic show when he wants to be entertained, if it's good enough for them to be good enough for me. And we were very fortunate, uh, you know, maybe half a dozen times uh, a year somebody really super famous would come to the show and people in the audience see that person and they go ah you know that's like some wow factor or something and this um we started a little bit before the uh big internet explosion um really helped us a lot it got us on different tv shows and write-ups in uh, newspapers and things like oh someone the so was spotted here it's in some gossip column or something that sold uh, more tickets i think than any advertising or anything could po possibly do. And uh, so we, that was, you know, it's definitely competitive in a, a community of uh, 10 million people in LA County, but on the same hand, you're not probably gonna get that opportunity um, if you have the show in Dubuque, Iowa. So, it, you know, I also like having the uh, workshop thing of, uh, I would have never, uh, experienced the developing uh, routines with big 12 illusions or, you know, five, every show I had four or five illusions in the show. Be a levitation, which was a, uh, 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 my wife and I, uh, Bozina had like a psychiatrist office scene where the psychiatrist falls in love with the patient. And, you know, the, there's goes into the levitation or she did a genius job. We had a seance scene that culminated in the Decolta chair where she disappeared from the stage and appears in the audience. All of these kind of things, I, up until that point, mostly did stand up my travel bag fit under the airplane seat and I had a garment bag. I didn't have any checked luggage or, and you know, I was able to develop a show with big illusions and, and, uh, and in the, the way we built the theater, uh, it had a very steep rake to the audience. So you could do close up sitting on the edge of the stage and everybody could see the coin assembly or the card thing. Uh, and we did really big illusions that were much too big for the to support for this amount of people in the audience. We had a 150 person audience. We could put in extra chairs and make it 200. And the kind of illusions we did, you would really only see for groups of 2,000 or or you know. Um, 
And because we didn't travel and we could tinker with the thing, and if we needed a trapdoor right here, we could just cut a hole in the stage and do, you know, it was great. It was really, really great. And um, uh, after 21 years, um, you know, somebody, it didn't end up working out, but somebody said to me, uh, it was an attorney from New York, you know, hey, have you ever considered selling Magicopolis? And, you know, I, without even thinking said, uh, well, yeah, but I, you know, I haven't met the right person yet. And really no one had ever even asked about it. Nothing happened with that deal. But for some reason it was in the air and other people started asking me. And at that point, you know, Bozine and I, we, you know, we really didn't want that responsibility so much anymore and never really considered that there was some way at the end that you would get paid to sell the theater. You know, we, if we ever thought about retiring or anything, we would sell, we would just probably close it. But no, it actually had built up a name and the value. And, and uh, uh, so we're very, very lucky, you know, very uh, grateful and uh, fortunate. Um, and it was the right time for us. Um, I, probably uh, were we to do another uh, uh, venue, it would be on a much more uh, modest and manageable scale without a lot of uh, employees and very high overhead and stuff like that. And uh, uh, it's beginning to look, if the, uh, there is a light at the end of the tunnel with the COVID, we might do something here in Hawaii. Um, uh, but in the meantime, we're just kind of enjoying life. Uh, as I say, I'm writing the new magic book. Well, when you decided to sell Magicopolis, um, did you have a plan in mind that was changed because of COVID? I mean, I-, I, no, no, I no, 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 this was before COVID. Yeah. We, we mean, sold, yeah. Yeah. We well, planned on uh, taking a, a, a world tour. We were gonna go uh, throughout uh, Europe and uh, maybe visit uh, Asia and South America and you know, the, the Caribbean and so on. And uh, we started by uh, going to Poland, where my uh, wife's folks live. And uh, we were on, like I say, we we're on our way to New Zealand. We stopped in Hawaii for a couple of weeks. We had the friends here. And then this terrible pandemic broke out. And it just happened to be we're in a space that uh, had a low infection rate and uh, seemed safe. And we were originally uh, uh, rented a, a, a condo like in a complex that was right near all the tourist area and everything. And eventually we relocated to when we were here. And when we first, we didn't know if we were gonna stay here two months or it's been a year. So now we're sort of comfortable here. And uh, we rented our house in Santa Monica. And uh, for the foreseeable future, at least, we'll be in Hawaii. I'm not sure if we might not relocate elsewhere. Um, it just, we're at a time in our life that we're uh, very lucky that we can sort of uh, ad lib our life as opposed to uh, uh, being under pressure to be in one spot in particular. Um, and we like it here. The weather is good, the, you know, what's not to like? <laughs> like I said at the beginning, it's paradise, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I, you kind of answered this question, but uh, I wanted to touch on it anyway. From a magical point of view, What's next? And what I mean by that is you've had a career that most people could only even dream of. You've owned your own successful theatre for 21 years. You've literally travelled the world. You've performed everywhere. Uh, you've, you, you're so highly respected. You've literally written the book on stand-up comedy, Magic, more than once. If you decided to, you know, just say, hey, I'm just going to retire in Hawaii and never perform again. Uh, you're, you, people will be talking about Steve Spill for a very, 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 very long time to come. But- well, Thank you, you've you made that sound so much better than it really is. I was just a working guy and uh, have been very lucky. And I would attribute most of that luck really to uh, falling in love with uh, Bozina and, and, and she really has enriched my life and, and helped me uh, uh, become a better person. And uh, if the scenario that you suggest were to play out, I would still uh, travel for pleasure. I would still be going to uh, art galleries and museums and plays and uh, watching movies. And uh, I have at least two or three magic books in me. You know, it just kind of spills out, so to speak. 
and uh, just kind of oozing out of the bat. So I, I, I think before the end of the year, I'll have this new book together. And, uh, and I also want to do one on close up. So um, yeah, I, do, I think that uh, I, the pace is certainly not as uh, uh, grueling and my responsibilities aren't what they uh, once were. Um, I do think that uh, having some a show, whether it's in Hawaii or somewhere or Amsterdam or wherever, you know, is probably still in the cards. Um, magic is one of those few things that you really don't have to give up. You know, the, uh, there's a lot of starlets that if they don't hit it by the time they're, you know, a teenager, their career is over with magic. You can kind of do it forever, you know. So I just probably have a slower pace. That's fantastic. That is absolutely amazing. And you know what, Steve? This has been a fantastic interview. If people want to reach out to you, is the best way through stevespill.com? Yeah, my uh, email is info at stevespill.com. And uh, you can contact me there. You can buy my books there. It's a very modest website. It just has a little few pictures, but complete descriptions of the books. And uh, I would be happy to hear from anybody that would like to uh, correspond. That is absolutely amazing. And whatever you do and you carry on doing, I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, it's, it, you know, the, the, I can only talk about my own act personally, but as I said at the beginning of this interview, you've been a big influence on my career. And uh, thank you. <laughs> Seriously. Oh, very, you make me feel really great. And uh, I appreciate uh, talking with you today, Craig, and um, mahalo. <laughs> mahalo. I'm, I'm guessing that's, that's Hawaiian. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the counterpart to aloha that I mentioned you at the beginning of the interview. Yeah. I've, I've learned something new. I've learned something new. Steve, thank you so much. Um, yeah, make sure. Uh, that you leave a comment down below in this video. I'm sure Steve will see it. I know you're quite active on social media from time to time, various different platforms. So uh, guys, make sure that you leave a comment down below. And I, as somebody who owns both of Steve's books, I highly suggest that you jump on that website and go and order them uh, post haste because they are brilliant. Even if you don't learn a single trick out of the book that you put in your act, just reading the first part of the books uh, the lessons that you learn from there are amazing and just the thinking behind the different routine and what I like about I'm deviating myself now but what I like about when you explain a trick it's not just a case of this is the effect this is the pattern this is the it's 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 done in a in a you always explain how you came up with this and why it was necessary to come up with this and it it's not just a case of here's a good trick it's a case of well let me explain why i put this together and this happened and this happened and i knew i had to do this and so this and and it's it's understanding that inspiration that really helps people's creativity and that's something that i haven't seen happen in many magic books um, well, again, I'm very flattered and happy to hear that you enjoy and have gotten a lot of my uh, writing. I enjoy doing it. And uh, I guess everybody has their own style. That's, that's how I write magic books. You know? It's great. It's great. It really is. So guys, jump on the website, buy the books, uh, leave a comment down below. And Steve, one more time, thank you very much for coming on the channel. My pleasure. Very much enjoyed it, Craig. Thanks, man. Everyone, take care. Bye, everyone.